Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. We are going to have uh, the second session of Discovering Islam. Uh, in the first lecture in uh, explaining uh, the uh, understanding of Islam, I chose the topic of the coherence in the Quran. Uh, one might wonder why this topic and no other uh, has been given this status of being the very first choice of uh, the understanding about Islam to be presented. Uh, the reason is that in order for Islam to be understood, you need to know the source properly. The source from where you're going to get the message of the Almighty. The fact of the matter is that unless you understand the Quran and you are impressed by the presentation of the Quran uh, properly, you will not be able to know that this source is the one that needs to be taken importance more than any other source. Um, and you can only be impressed by the Quran if you understand how the Quran has been designed. Um, it has been marshaled by the Almighty in the sequence that we find it today. So I mentioned the fact that the uh, coherence of the Quran has three different levels. The first level of coherence is to be found in Surah Unity. What we find is that the Quranic surahs, all of them, all 114 surahs of the Quran, they have a central theme and all verses are one way or the other supporting, clarifying uh, the surah's theme. And I gave a few examples to emphasize the point that all surahs of the Quran have a definite theme which are uh, supported by all its verses. The other level of coherence in the Quran is at the level of surah pairs. I mentioned the fact that the Quran, out of its 114 surahs, six are exceptions and the rest of 108 surahs are divided into 54 surah pairs. Uh, the idea is that if you read the two surahs in the pair which come adjacent to each other, you will find that uh, they have a lot to uh, discuss uh, in matters which are common to them. Although they have their own respective independent central themes, they have a lot in common. When you understand it and you're convinced about it, you will you will get this intellectual as well as spiritual pleasure on reading the surahs uh, by discover, discovering yourself as your personal experience of a number of things that probably some other people may not have been able to discover them. So I'll give you three examples. Uh, one example, probably the most prominent example is the example of the second and third surahs of the Quran, Surah Al-Imran, the third surah, and Surah Al-Baqarah, the second surah. Uh, I'll just point out a few commonalities which are striking, and they cannot be just accidental. The first commonality between the two surahs is that they're both Madan and surahs. This is something which has got to always be the case uh, when we are talking about surah pairs, that either they're going to be both Meccan or they're going to be Madanan. So Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Al-Imran, they are both Madanan Surahs. They both begin with Alif Lam Mi. Uh, we call them Huruf Muqattat, disjointed letters. The first Surah we have already studied, Surah Al-Fatiha, doesn't begin with Alif Lam Mi. The fourth Surah, Surah An-Nisa, doesn't begin with Alif Lam Mi. So it obviously is something very significant why exactly is it that the Almighty decided that these two surahs begin with Alif Lam Mi? What do they mean? Well, we'll talk about it later. 
but this is one important as if declaration from the Almighty that look here, these two surahs of my book put together, they form a pair. You move on and right at the beginning you find that in Surah Al-Baqarah the Almighty says Zalikal Kitab Ularai This is the book of God. The awaited book. There is no doubt about it. And Surah al Imran also mentioned in the third verse Nazzala Alaikal Kitab Bilhaq This is much the same thing said in a different way. God has revealed his book which is true, which is the ultimate truth. And he has revealed it in a way that there has been a lot of measures of preparation that have been taken. So this is another aspect. You move on to verses 76 of Surah Al-Baqarah and 72 and 73 of Surah Al-Imran and you, you would find that the Almighty is talking about the conspiracy of the hypocrites and the Jews that they were they were attempting to dislodge to undermine the message of the Almighty. Uh, you find that the same theme is being discussed in both verses, uh, in in both passages. Verses one verse one twenty of Surah Al Baqarah and verse seventy three of Surah Al Imran are mentioning one statement which is not mentioned anywhere else in the Quran. But the wordings are slightly different. Almost the same. Uh, the sequence of words have been altered slightly. In Surah Al-Baqarah, the Almighty says, Qul, tell them, Inna hudallahi huwal huda. The guidance of Allah is the only guidance. This was actually in response to the uh, attempt at controversy that you know, people of the book and the hypo hypocrites were trying to create. And the Almighty said that, look here, forget about your sectarian differences, your attempts to prove that your religion, your sectarian point of view is correct. The only true guidance is the guidance that comes from God. So, Bakra says, Qul inna hudallahi huwal huda. And Al Imran says, Qul inna huda hudallah. There is no other guidance except the guidance of the Almighty. Then we move on to verse 129 and 151. There are two verses in Surah Al Baqarah. And 164, uh, one verse in Surah Al Imran. Both are talking about the same subject. What exactly is the purpose of this religion? What does it exactly target? What are its ingredients? And where does it come from? Three important questions. What is the real source of this religion? What are the ingredients, components of its message? And number three, what is the ultimate goal? The brief answer to these questions, three questions is, the only source of uh, God's message is the messenger of God. May God's mercy be on him. What does it constitute? The answer is, is Al-Kitab and Al-Hikmah, the law and moral principles and beliefs. And what is the target? What does it seek to achieve? And the answer is Tazkiya. Purification. Moral purification plus excellence. So it's mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah twice, in verse 129 and 151, and Surah Al-Imran once, 164. Then we move on to another very important topic in both surahs. And that is the role and importance of this Ummah that the Almighty has picked, chosen. Uh, surah Al-Baqarah 143 verse, which is right at the center in the middle of Surah Al-Baqarah because Surah, surah Al-Baqarah has 286 verses. So it's verse 143. Uh, it talks about the fact that the Almighty has chosen this Ummah the Prophet, may God's mercy be on him, the children of his smile and his companions. And the idea is that the Prophet would deliver the message to his companions and they, they will in turn deliver it to the rest of the mankind. Uh, in Surah Al-Ibran, 
The same topic has been discussed in a slightly different way. It says in verse 110 that the role of this Ummah is that they invite others towards virtue and goodness and they prevent others from doing what is evil. Then we move on to uh, another striking similarity between the, these two surahs, which is again a subject you will not find discussed anywhere else in the Quran. Uh, the reality that those who die in the way of Allah, the martyrs, shahada, they don't perish. It's you who think that they're gone, but they, they are living and they have a very good life. In Surah Al-Baqarah, you find verse 154 talking about it. And in Surah Al-Imran, you find verses 169 to 171 talking about the same subject in greater detail. Then we go to uh, verse 159 of Surah Al-Baqarah and verse 77 of Surah Al-Imran, both talking about another very important topic not discussed anywhere else. And that is that the people of the book, they are concealing the truth. The scholars of the children of Israel, because they do not want this last message to be accepted and believed in by by the people, they had planned to hide and conceal those realities that were present mentioned in their books. So that is mentioned in these two surahs. Another important uh, topic that only these two surahs discuss in, in, in such clarity is this question that the Almighty asks the believers. that If they really want to enter the paradise, then they will have to live up to the expectations of the Almighty. Do you think you are going to be able to enter the paradise without going through the difficulties, the trials, okay. uh, the uh, problems? So that's another important uh, commonality. Then the prohibition of riba is mentioned in detail in Surah Al-Baqarah. And it's also referred to in Surah Al-Imran, verse 275 to 281, and Surah Al-Imran, verse 130. And finally, both surahs end with very effective uh, du'as. You know, we ask the Almighty for help. In Surah Baqarah, we know that the very last verse, verse 286 is talking about it. And in Surah Al-Imran, it's verses 191 to 194. So what I'm trying to say is that the Quran has been designed by the Almighty in its present form in a way that almost all surahs, they form pairs. There are six except exceptions. The exceptions are Surah Al-Fatiha. We talked about it. Um, surah An-Nur, the 24th surah. Surah Al-Ahzab, the 33rd surah. Um, then we have Surah Yasin, which is 36th Surah, Surah Al-Hujrat, which is the 49th Surah, and Surah Al-Waqiyah, which is the 56th Surah. Except for Surah Al-Fatiha, which is obviously the starting message of the Quran, and possibly Surah Yasin. Uh, the rest of the four Surahs are actually kind of summarizing uh, the subjects, topics that were dis discussed in the earlier surahs. The second pair that I have chosen for presentation is the pair of surahs 16 and 17. They are just, you know, pairs picked, well, randomly. You will find all surahs who are in, that are in pairs uh, giving us the same understanding of, you know, many topics that are common in both, both surahs. Surah An-Nahl is surah number 16 and surah Bani Israel is surah number 17. In surah An-Nahl and surah Bani Israel, you find that there are at least three subjects which are common to both. But it's not that there is repetition. Uh, they are both discussed in the two surahs in their own respective ways. The first subject is moral principles. In Surah An-Nahl, we have verse 90 
which talks about uh, the six basic principles of morality. Three positive, three negative. In one verse, verse 90. This is a famous verse which if you attend uh, the Khutbah of Friday prayers, you probably would know it. You probably would have it in your memory. In Allah, Yahmur bil Adli bal Ihsan wa Ita'i zil Qurba wa Yanha anil Fahshai wal Munkari wal Bal. Yaizukum la Allah kum tazakkarum. So it gives us six basic moral principles. Obviously, it's not just an accident that in the very next surah, which it's which is its uh, partner surah, you have these principles described in more detail from verse 22 to verse 39. So this is one, uh, call it similarity uh, in the two. The second is that these both surahs are Meccan surahs and they were revealed close to Hijra, close to the time of migration. And both are pointing towards Hijra. In Surah An-Nahl, in verse 41, that subject has been discussed. And in Surah Ali Imran, sorry, in Surah Bani Israel, it's from verse 80 to 81, Hijra. The third important topic that has been discussed is uh, the misdeeds and the negative activities of the Jews, who, because they found that to their disappointment, they were waiting for a messenger. They were waiting for a prophet, for prophet from God. But they were expecting the prophet to be from within the children of Israel. But it turned out to their disappointment that the one who came, came from the children of Ismail. And as a consequence of, uh, you know, something happening that they were expecting to happen, but happening in a different way, they were jealous of the children of uh, Ismail. And they started conspiring against uh, uh, the Muslims. And this has been mentioned in Surah An-Nahl from verse 91 to 95 and in Surah uh, Bani Israel from verse 4 to 10. Their misdeeds and uh, then the consequences of it. Uh, then we move on to the third pair. Uh, the first pair was Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Al-Imran right at the beginning. And the third pair is the very last two surahs. They're so similar to each other that they carry one common name, al muabbazatain The two surahs that seek protection from the Almighty. Protection against the evils that are there threatening us. What we find is that uh, whereas in Surah Al-Falaq is giving us wordings of prayers that enable us to seek the Almighty's protection against the evil that is in the outside world. In Surah An-Nas, what we find is that the same words have been used, but we, have seek, we seek the Almighty's help in getting protected, protected against the evil that lies within us. So, you know, the two surahs put together, they form a pair. So what I'm trying to present is that the Almighty's presentation of the Quran has been designed by him in a way that it has a lot of wisdom. Its wisdom can be found at the level of each surah. Its wisdom of coherence is to be found at the level of surah pairs. And the last part of it is that its wisdom is to be found at the level of surah groups. The entire Quran has been designed in a way that you can see that it has seven different surah groups. Each group beginning with one or more Meccan surahs and each group ending with one or more Madanan surah. So Meccan surahs followed by Madanan surahs, there are seven groups. I probably mentioned in my first presentation that there are people who raise this objection, non-Muslims as well as Muslims. You know, why has the Quran been designed in the way it has been done, even though we know full well that its chronological, historical arrangement was very different. So I tried to respond to the quest this question by saying that uh, when the Quran was being initially revealed, it had a different mission. It had a, di it had a different target. 
The target was to make sure that the Prophet, may Allah's mercy be on him, is able to let the message be put across to his immediate addressees in such an effective way that there remains no excuse left for them not to believe in it, which is called itmam e hujja mm -hmm. And after this itmam e hujja is done, they're going to be eligible for the Almighty's punishment, as has been the case in all uh, stories of the Messengers Rasul. Whoever came to this world as a Rasul, uh, his nation was punished. This is the Almighty's law, his policy, his sunnah. So that sunnah was followed in the last Rasul's case as well. So the Quran was des designed and was revealed for a period of 23 years to begin with, with that purpose in mind. However, after that important target was achieved, uh, there was an ummah that got formed and the ummah was given this book of God and it was redesigned, it was marshaled differently. Its arrangement was done in a way that we now have seven surah groups each group has its own central theme. They're all talking about the same prophetic mission. And uh, we now, when we read the Quran, each time we read one group, we are able to kind of complete one Quranic message, full complete message. You know, you come to learn that you have actually done complete justice with the message of the Almighty. Now, the same message is repeated six times more in different ways. So you find that there is repetition in the Quran, but you also find that it's not without reason. It is effectively reminding you about all the important realities that need to be continuously uh, reminded uh, for the believer. Or else he's going to be lost in this world and is not going to be able to pursue the purpose of life. So we have seven surah groups. What groups are they? The first group starts from the first surah Al-Fatiha and has four Madan surahs. So it, it ends at the fifth surah. The second group begins with surah number six and ends at surah number nine. The third group begins with surah 10 and ends at surah 24. The fourth group begins with surah 25 and ends at surah 33. The fifth group starts with surah 34 and ends at Surah 49. The sixth group begins with Surah number 50 and ends at Surah 63. The last group begins with Surah number 67 and ends at Surah 114. Don't be too impressed. I'm, I've repeated it so many times that I can't forget it. So, you know, I mean, this is something that uh, if you are able to uh, understand uh, and uh, appreciate you will really start enjoying reading the Quran uh, with its understanding and meanings. I have picked one surah group to just briefly explain um, how each surah uh, is able to serve the purpose of uh, delivering the message of the surah, the, the, the theme of the surah group. So each surah group has a central theme and each surah is contributing in its own way towards that theme. So the choice is of the second group of surahs. Um, one of the reasons why I've chosen this group is that it has the uh, smallest number of surahs, four surahs, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, all these four surahs put together Two of them are Meccan and they are in pairs. Surah Al-Anam and Surah Al-Araf. And the other two are Madanan. And they also form a pair. Surah Al-Anfal and Surah Tawbah. Now, what is the central theme? The central theme of this group is the prophetic mission of the last prophet, may Allah's mercy be on him, that ultimately culminated in the punishment of those who rejected the truth. So you might call uh, the punishment of Kuffar as the central idea, the central theme that has been discussed.
The way the four surahs, they contribute towards this uh, task is that the first surah al-anam is actually inviting people to have faith. And it's warning them that if they are not going to believe in the message that is being delivered to them by somebody who belongs to their own nation and therefore is communicating the message so clearly and effectively that if they are going to say no to it, they're actually going to do it knowing that it's from God and it's going to be a huge crime and they're going to face the consequences. So invitation and warning is the first surah Al-Anam. Al-Araf, the seventh surah and the second surah of this group is warning them and is making sure that all evidences and arguments are presented to them in such a complete and convincing way that they are left with no justification for rejecting it. So what you call itmam e hujjah is what is being done in the seventh surah. Now, after itmam e hujjah has been done, uh, there would come this stage when the nation, the group of people who reject, they're going to be punished. So Surah Al-Anfal is doing two things. It's purifying, cleansing uh, the people who are the companions of the Prophet, number one. And number two, preparing them for jihad. The jihad that was necessary to be undertaken to inflict the Almighty's punishment on a nation that had rejected the Almighty's message. Now, it's, it's important to explain this particular uh, concept. You see, when we say that the nations that reject the message of the messengers are punished by the Almighty, the Quran is clear that this punishment can take basically two forms. It could either come in the form of natural calamities, or it could come in the form of the military might inflicting God's punishment on the enemies, on the kuffar. If the followers of the messengers are few, that it's the first possibility that is employed. But the, if the followers are large in number, then it is the second possibility that is employed. Because in the case of the last prophet, may Allah's mercy be on him, the number of followers that he was able to attract was large. Therefore, it was the second possibility that was uh, that was made use of. And uh, the Almighty's decision is that if you are to be picked for a project of his, if he makes you a member of the group that is going to achieve a target that he has set forth, you've got to be up to the task. You've got to first make yourself uh, eligible for it. And for that purpose, the companions were made to be purified. They were informed that, look here, you have been given an extremely important task. And if you are not going to, if you're not going to purify yourself morally and spiritually, you're not going to be selected for the purpose. It is, it is a great privilege to become soldiers of the Almighty to become his tools to inflict his punishment on the enemies. So therefore, Surah Al-Anfal is uh, focusing more on purifying the believers and, you know, those who are not, who didn't belong to their category, who didn't qualify, who didn't deserve, they were then taken away. They were distinguished from uh, the mainstream uh, companions. And the second thing that the surah mentions is preparation for jihad. That is what you find in this surah because this surah, after uh, the people who rejected the message, rejected it without any reason. They, they were stubborn. They continued to reject it without any reason. Um, it was about time that they were to be punished. But for that, for the punishment to, to come about, it was important that the people who were being picked for inflicting that punishment they should be up to the task. They should be deserving. So they were being prepared. The final surah of this group is Surah Tawba. This is a surah of punishment. It doesn't begin with Bismillah of Magari. 
because in Bismillah Rahman Rahim, you have the two names of the Almighty, both emerging from the same attribute of Rahma, mercy. Um, the message of this surah was not consistent with this understanding. So, Tasmiya was removed. The surah talks about the Almighty's punishment on three groups put together were all kuffar. Kafir, by the way, is a person or a group of people who reject the truth coming from the Almighty knowingly. So there were three groups. Polities, al-Mushrikun, the people of the book, al-Kitab, and the hypocrites, al-Munafikun. You find that the first 28 verses are talking about the punishment that was inflicted on the Mushrikeen. Verses 29 to 35 talk about the punishment for the people of the book. And from verse 36 till the end of the surah, 129, it's talking about the hypocrites because the hypocrites are the most difficult of the group of, of, of the people who were to be punished. So, uh, because they were a part of Muslims apparently and they had to be distinguished from the mainstream Muslims and therefore their punishment or the, the text that talks about their punishment is much lengthier, talks about it in more detail. So what I've tried to say in uh, my uh, presentation is that the Quran is a completely coherent book. Its coherence has been arranged, designed by the Almighty in a way that if you understand it, it, it is very impressive. Uh, it attracts you, your attention to read the Quran with deep reflection to be able to uncover more and more wonders and treasures of wisdom that lay underneath the presentation of coherence. So what I've done is just an introduction. And I can assure you that if you start taking interest in reading the Quran with a view to understand how it has been in uh, arranged by the Almighty, you'll be able to discover much more. May the Almighty enable us to understand the Quran properly and may he enable us to uh, follow its expectations to the best of our abilities. Mm -hmm.